How you doing, guys? <laughs> My name is Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. Uh, Hubbard's Marina is located right inside John's Pass, Madeira Beach. Uh, we're family owned and operated, we're family oriented. We do a lot of different types of fishing trips. Uh, we do uh, party boat fishing and we do charter boat fishing. Our party boat fishing, we do 5, 10, 12, 35, 44, and 63 hour trips. And we also do private charters. We have four different types of private charter boats. Uh, we have uh, anywhere from a 60 foot Hatteras, which is more of like a yacht style vessel, uh, to a center console go fast boat, to a hydrofoil assisted catamaran. We also have like a cabin cruiser type vessel as well. So anything you want to do on the water, any size group you have, whatever you want to catch in the Gulf of Mexico, we've got a trip for you to go get it. And uh, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about near shore and offshore fishing and whatever you guys want to talk about and hear about. Hopefully I can help you guys get a few tips and tricks uh, to help you be more successful near shore and offshore, whether you're fishing with me or fishing with someone else or fishing on your own boats. How many of you guys uh, have your own boat 25 foot or more where you're offshore fishing past 10 miles fairly regularly? Very good. That'll make it easy today. All right. Uh, so we'll talk mostly about uh, fishing with charter boats and head boats then. Uh, did anybody uh, not get a red raffle ticket? All right. If you haven't got one, come on up real quick. Let me get you a raffle ticket before we get started. There you go, man. Thanks for coming. All right, so at the end of the seminar, we'll pick uh, two raffle tickets. Uh, the first one will win a 10-hour all-day. The second one will win a five-hour half-day, and then we'll give away those uh, $10 gift cards that Bass Pro Shops so graciously gave us as well. So a little bit of extra winners today. Uh, so big things on the radar coming up, on the forecast coming up, guys, we have uh, Amberjack season uh, opens May 1st. Amberjack are going to be open May, uh, August, September, and October. So those Amberjack are going to be a really, really cool species to go out there and target in deep water. Amberjack are typically 35, 40 miles plus about 120 foot of water or more. Our 12 hour extreme, our 39 hour, our 44 hour are definitely the trips to go get them. Uh, and then we have Red Snapper opening June 1st. Red Snapper will run through July 22nd at 12.01 a.m. What a lot of people don't realize uh, on Red Snapper is they give those end dates so specifically. So July 22nd, it, Red Snapper ends, but it's 12.01 a.m. So you have to be back at the dock with your fish unloaded by July 21st at midnight, effectively making July 21st the last day of season. Every year towards the end of the season, that becomes a question. So I want to make sure you guys are well aware of that. The private recreational season for Red Snapper is June 11th through July 21st at 12.01 a.m. So private recreational season is the one you see on FWC, the one the governor did the press release, that's the private recreational season. We are all recreational anglers, whether you're on a my boat, a charter boat, a head boat, a dock, a pier, your own boat, but unfortunately, when it comes to red snapper and red snapper only, there's subsectors. You have the four hire sector, which is any charter boat or head boat with federal permits, and then you have private recreational, which is you guys in your own boats, your buddies' boats, or a charter boat that doesn't have federal permits. So that private rec season is June 11th through July 21st. The four hire season with us is going to be June 1st through July 22nd. All right? A lot of confusion with that every year, too. Gags will open June 1st as well. Gag grouper are a really uh, sought after grouper species. Uh, they bite best, in my opinion, in months and even ER. September, October, November, December, those are the best months for gags. Typically around Thanksgiving is my favorite time for gag grouper. A real good time of year. People always ask, what's the best time of year to go fishing? When can I go out with you and catch the most fish, the best fish, the biggest fish? In my opinion, uh, there's a few times a year to go. Nowadays, it's not so much what's the best time of year, but what's open? What do you want to catch? 
because the seasons kind of dictate when you want to go based on what you want to catch. But my favorite time of year, uh, anytime, is always those transitional periods, which is what we're coming up on. We've had our summer, or our uh, winter in Florida where we have these cold fronts. Those cold fronts slow down and stop, and then it just slowly gets hotter and hotter and hotter through the summer. Uh, so in late April, early May, the cold fronts stop, the high pressures kind of calm down, and we start transitioning to that summer time uh, pattern where we have the onshore breeze and the afternoon thunderstorms. That transitional period is my, one of my favorite times of year to go fishing. Second is the other transitional period on the back side of summer. When we, those, just before those cold fronts start coming, uh, but after it stops being so darn hot. So like the first couple weeks of October. Uh, and that time of year is a great time of year for a lot of different species, both spring and fall. Uh, in spring, uh, gags aren't open, but they bite very well. So we're catching a lot of gags right now during this transitional period. They're super aggressive, but to catch the least species right now. Uh, kingfish are going really well. We're catching a lot of kingfish near shore and offshore. We caught a 40 pound kingfish on the 10 hour all day the other day. Caught a 39 pound kingfish on the, uh, or on the 39 hour. We caught the 40 pound kingfish on the 10 hour. And uh, we had about, uh, I think he's around 13 years old. Caught his first kingfish and weighed in at 36 pounds on a five hour half day the other day. So the kingfish are big and they're pretty plentiful near shore right now. <coughs> tuna, we got a lot of tuna around offshore. Uh, catch a lot of tuna on our 39 hours, on our 12 hour streams, on the flat lines. We're also catching tuna on the trolling. Uh, trolling for tuna. Where'd my lures go? There they are. Trolling for tuna. I like using the Rapala extracts the Magnum 30 or the Magnum 20s. They work really well for the tuna. Uh, these also catch plenty of kingfish. Near shore when I'm trolling, I'm typically using uh, the planer, number one or number two planer uh, with the spoon. Uh, they work really well, about 15 to 18 foot of monofilament or fluorocarbon in between your spoon and your planer. Uh, is the, generally the setup we use for the first like 35 miles or so. Uh, trolling and right now plenty of mackerel, uh, plenty of decent sized kingfish in near shore and then once you get offshore into that blue water is where you start seeing the tuna and the bigger kingfish right now. Uh, hogfish bite really well in March and April. We're kind of on the back side of that big hogfish push uh, but we're still catching some hogs and we will continue to catch hogfish through the summer. It's just not the kind of the hot heavy. Uh, peak that you see in March and April. Uh, now, one last time before we get rolling here, uh, who hasn't got raffle tickets? I saw three of you guys walked up. Up oh, there's four of you walked up. All right, we'll get you guys raffle tickets and then no one else will get raffle tickets when keep it fair. One for you, three for you guys. All right. So, what do you guys want to talk about? Like I said at the beginning, I want to talk about what you guys want to talk about. Well, as I look and I there see the go. fish that are lying in corn over there, are yeah. you know that we can focus to? I've not fished here before. You've not fished here before. Right. The, the biggest thing I could recommend to you would be, uh, are you going to be fishing on your own boat? Uh, no. All right, what I would recommend is starting small. If you haven't fished offshore before, have you fished offshore before? If you haven't fished offshore before, start small. Do uh, some party boat fishing. Party boat fishing, uh, to me, is a great experience because it allows you to get on a big boat with other people. And so often, you'll get someone who's not been fishing offshore before, not they just moved to the area, and it gives you the ability to get trapped offshore with 20, 30, 40 other people who like fishing too. Uh, so I always tell people, uh, especially when they're fishing by themselves, sit back, look, who else is by themselves, or who else is having a good time, and buy a beer and start talking. Now, what I did growing up, I grew up uh, fishing on these party boats. And what I would do is I'd find the oldest, saltiest, grumpiest looking guy, and I'd buy him a beer or a couple beers, and then get him talking, and just sit next to him and uh, chat, with, chat with him about fishing. Hey, what works for you? And starts telling you stories. And you can get a, uh, a great opportunity uh, so often, especially fishermen. Who here doesn't like telling fishing stories? I mean, we all do. So 
you get them talking, they start telling you some fishing stories, some fishing tips. Oh, how did you catch that? Where did you catch that? That's a great opportunity and a great resource. Uh, and then as far as learning how to fish, you, the biggest thing I'd recommend is doing what you're doing here. Uh, trying to attend seminars, learn a little bit more about near shore fishing. Uh, if you're just starting out, the biggest thing to do is making sure that you're getting set up with the right tools for the job. Uh, I always like to try to keep uh, a couple tackle options uh, handy. Uh, first thing you need when fishing in the area is a spinning rod. Uh, where are you from? From Michigan, but I live here now. Michigan, all right. So in Michigan, you're probably used to seeing the spinning reels and the fly rods, that kind of stuff. A good spinning reel is a good, great starting spot, uh, not only for fishing onshore and fishing from the docks and piers, but also offshore. Uh, I use the spinning rod offshore for a multitude of different things. Uh, near shore, I use the spinning rod for the hogfish, uh, for the smaller snapper species. Offshore, I use a little bit bigger spinning reel than this, uh, like a five or 6,000 series spinning reel for the mangrove snapper, and also for uh, flat lining for some of those fish, and then also knocker rig as well if the bike gets slow. Uh, but a good like 4,000 series spinning reel with about 20 pound braid, maybe even 30 pound braid, uh, and a top shot. You always want to use a monofilament or a fluorocarbon top shot. I use fluorocarbon, especially when I'm targeting hogfish. Uh, so like a, uh, anywhere from about 20 to 30 pound braid, 30 pound fluorocarbon top shot, uh, about 20 feet, 20 to 25 feet of fluorocarbon. Uh, you just do a little line to line knot, so that way your braid is a majority of line in your reel. And then you have that floral carbon on top to give you a little bit of stretch and to make sure that when you're fishing, that fish doesn't see the braid. It's just seeing nothing because the floral carbon disappears. And that setup is going to be a good all-around starting setup. Kind of get your feet wet, see if you like it. If you don't like offshore fishing, you can still use that near shore and uh, have a good time. The other thing I like uh, bringing with me, uh, the next step really, would be like a good 4,000 series conventional reel. Uh, this is my uh, single speed uh, conventional reel that I take out with me near shore fishing. Uh, this is going to have braid backing and a monofilament top shot as well. Uh, and this is a high speed reel. Uh, so nowadays we have this great technology out there where there's a lot of, you buy these fancy little baby reels that are super light uh, and super sensitive and they're really high speed. And a high speed reel is great uh, for fishing for snapper and smaller uh, fish species. Uh, but when you start getting into the bigger fish, the high speed reel is not that great because the higher the gear ratio, the lower the power you have. The lower the gear ratio, the higher the power you have. But a high gear ratio reel is important because you have more speed. So it allows you to set the hook more quickly and be a little bit more efficient for those quick bite snapper. Now on the flip side of that, a little bit more pricey, uh, but well worth it in my opinion, is the two-speed reel. The two-speed reel allows you to not only have the uh, high-speed, small, light combo, but it also is one of these heavier, low-speed reels all in one. Uh, and the, the, all you have to do is with the press of a button, it's like changing reels but you still are using the same rod and reel combination. That's why I love these two-speed reels, and that's why uh, I feel they're a little bit more pricey, because it's almost like fishing with two reels in one. I've got the high speed, I can set the hook easy, but if I set the hook and my rod doubles over and I got a big fish on, I just press a button, and it's like you've downshifted in your vehicle. You've got, all of a sudden, you've gone from a 6.2 to 1 to a 3 to 1. So your rate, uh, gear ratio drops in half and your power doubles. Uh, so it's really impressive. I'll show you real quick. So I'm in high, uh, high gear ratio right now. See where my lead is? I'm gonna turn this handle one revolution and watch how much that lead moves. So one revolution of the handle, that lead moves almost six feet, or five feet in I'm a fisherman, I hope <laughs> So we're going to switch to low gear, and we're going to do the same thing. One revolution of the handle. The lead didn't move very much. Pretty noticeable difference in the fact that 
the lower the gear ratio, the less line you retrieve and the more power. And I'll illustrate the power difference real quick. So I always set, there's a little, uh, the unfortunate part of a two-speed reel is they don't make a two-speed reel in a star drag. All lever, or all two-speed reels come with a lever drag. No pen, no Shimano, no Daiwa, nobody makes a two-speed star drag. Not yet. Every year at iCast, I bet, but no one listens. So help me out, guys. But uh, a, two, a lever drag uh, takes a little bit of a learning curve to learn how to use. I always set the strike. Each uh, lever drag wheel is going to have a little strike button or a little strike mark or a little uh, dot. Not indicate strike. So what I do is I set the drag. Uh, so when I put that lever to strike, it's a good drag. It's not locked down, but it's a decent drag. It's good for my snapper fishing. Maybe if I hope the red grouper, it's going to be okay. And then when it's set to strike, and that and that just barely uh, set drag, you can still get line out. If I hook a big fish, all I have to do is press that drag all the way forward, and now the drag is almost locked down it's a lot harder to pull line out. So just with a, just a click of a button and a simple adjustment to the lever, it's like I've totally switched reels. And I'll show you real quick. So right now, I'm in high gear, grab that left for me. Right now, I'm in high gear ratio, uh, and I've got my lever set to strike. I've hooked my snapper and I start cranking. Oh man, I, I, I can turn this handle all I want, but I've heard the gears on the reel. But you turn, notice I can turn this handle all I want. I'm not really, he's not even trying to hold me back. But with the click of a button and a slide forward of my lever, I can crank his arm right out no matter what he tries to do. He's going to eventually let go of that lever. So the, that's the difference in the power. Real simple adjustment, quick adjustment. Uh, I've got a lot more power and the ability to pull in a big fish which so often you'll be fishing for a mangrove snapper or other snapper species and you'll hook a big fish and with the little single speed reel you're in a little bit of trouble you know because you don't have much power with the two speed reel you have the ability to get that fish in but the difference is a single speed reel you can pick a nice single speed high speed reel up for 150 200 250 bucks a two speed reel you're going to start at like 250 to 300 bucks and a nice one's 400, 450 bucks. So the price differs a little bit in that respect. Then you've got the old work, workhorses. You can buy a conventional reel, uh, a single speed, uh, medium gear ratio, low gear ratio reel uh, for 80, 90, 100 bucks. Uh, and a lot of these uh, old school uh, pens. Uh, and some of the old dial 400 and 600 H's, you can pick them up used as well. Like we sell a used 9 aqua pen in our shop for 150 bucks, you know? And you can pull in a big fish with one of those. So uh, I've got, I showed you my spinning rod. I showed you like the 4 aught conventional reel. And then this would be my 6 aught conventional reel. And this would be for my red groupers, my smaller gags. Uh, just 68 pound test line and a bigger 7, 8 odd hook. And that's going to be a good all around kind of medium grouper rod. And then you've got your big boy, your 9 odd reel, where you've got the 125 pound, 100 pound test, maybe 150 to 200 pound leader, your big 10 odd or 12 odd hook. Uh, and this is going to be for your big, big amber jack or your big baits for the big gag grouper. And you can also use the same rail for trolling as well. So uh, that combination is going to be a good starting spot, or a, really a great starting spot to kind of give you a wide variety of ability. Uh, but I always start small. Start with a five-hour trip with your spinning rod, work up to a 10-hour trip with a spinning rod and a four-hour, then get up to a 12-hour trip with a six-hour, then do a 39-hour trip with a all. you know? <laughs> So you just kind of work your way up, start small, uh, and learn as you go. Each trip, each trip you learn something new. My, uh, my saying is the day you stop learning is the day you die. Because uh, every trip I go on, I learn something new from the guys and gals we take out fishing. Everybody does something a little different. That's my favorite part about fishing. You can go fishing in St. Petersburg and you can be an expert. You can be doing it your whole life, 80 years old, you know it all. 
But if you go to the East Coast, two hours away, what you do every day for a living, they'll laugh at you for doing the same thing on the East Coast because it's completely different. So that's why I enjoy fishing so much because it's so regional, so local to your area, and everybody does something a little different. So some traveling fishermen, like guys who come in from Michigan, or guys who come in from New York, or guys who come in from California, everybody does something a little different. Uh, and you can kind of learn tips and tricks from everybody. So biggest, biggest thing to answer your question, if you're starting out, is just listen up, ask questions, and watch. If you see a guy down the rails catching fish when no one else is, pretty good idea to go, go look, see what he's doing differently, you know? Long-winded answer, but did I answer your question? <laughs> I hope I the dog to sleep, so I must have put something right. Any other questions? question was, was good to, what's a good rod and reel combo to catch a big amberjack all the way down to a small snapper? If I had to pick one rod to fish offshore every day, I would pick around a four to six out reel uh, with like a four to one gear ratio uh, and about 60 pound test. That way I could put a 80 or 100 pound leader on it, lock down the drag for a big amberjack or the biggest gag I can handle. Then I could put a 40 pound leader on it and a smaller hook to also catch some mangrove snapper. For example, if you go out and fish with us and you rent a rod and reel, that's kind of what we do. We give you one rod and reel that does a little bit of everything okay. Or you could go out and spend uh, $800 to $1,000 or $2,000 and $3,000 and get four or five rods that do a little bit of everything very well. Uh, but that's a pretty big time investment, a big, pretty big financial investment. Yeah, you laugh, exactly. Yeah, it is. Not for him. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Good question, man. Sir? Near shore grouper. Near shore grouper. All right, I don't like that question. That no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Near shore grouper. Uh, the, the, that's, a, that's a problem, to be honest, right now. I mean, near shore grouper, to me, is red grouper uh, this time of year. Uh, in the cooler months, again, months ending in ER, those gags will start pushing in. Uh, you can get some gags at 60, 80, 90 feet right now, uh, but they're not open. Uh, red grouper are your more near shore grouper in the spring and summer. And uh, typically by now, the red grouper have kind of been a little bit more aggressive and moved in shore. Up until three days ago, uh, during the seminar, I would have said in the spring and summer, red grouper move inshore uh, and uh, gag grouper move offshore. And then in the winter time, gag grouper move inshore, red grouper move offshore. Well, uh, I was in a marine resource education program. We uh, did a lot of stuff on the science of the fishery. The gag grouper do move. That's a fact. They move inshore in the winter time to move offshore and spread out in the summertime. Red grouper apparently don't move very much, which kind of blows my mind because my grandfather, his father, my father have always said during the summertime red grouper push in, during the winter time they push off a little bit. And that's always been the pattern as far as catching. Maybe in the summertime they don't bite as well uh, or maybe in the winter time they don't bite as well near shore. Uh, but this year we have not seen that big push of red grouper bite near shore. Typically by late April, early May, through the summer we have a really good red grouper bite. Red grouper fishing has kind of been on a decline lately. Right now we're catching red grouper pretty well, uh, but we have to go way offshore. Like our 12 hour streams getting plenty of red grouper, our 39 hours getting red grouper, but we're catching them 140, 150 foot plus. Uh, so that's not near shore. So right now, near shore grouper fishing is tough. Uh, but what I would recommend to you would be during the summertime, hopefully this red grouper bite's gonna pick up, turn around, during the summertime, uh, hopefully by mid-May-ish, uh, those red grouper will be biting good near shore. And what I like doing for them, the best way to target red grouper is near shore drift fishing. Uh, so you set up a drift and you drift over large areas of hard rock bottom uh, with a two-speed reel uh, with the ability to switch to low gear. 
I hope the table, uh, or a uh, like a six stop reel uh, with about 60 pound cast and a 60 pound leader. Uh, and what I like doing is I for drift fishing. Uh, the reason you drift fish for red grouper is red grouper are going to be hanging out over a large area, hard rock bottom near shore. And they are a little bit more of a scavenger. Uh, they'll hang on a rock or they'll hang in a pothole or a crevice or a crack, but they tend to move a little bit more than uh, the gags will. They'll kind of forage the area looking for crabs, shrimp, squid, whatever they're going to find. Uh, and when you're drift fishing, you're able to cover a larger area of more of those potholes, show your bait to more fish. Guys, they're going to hang on a rock or a ledge, and they're going to be kind of tucked in their hole, hanging in that hole, and they're going to be hunting for a fish, waiting for a fish to swim by and ambush it. So red grouper, you can drift, cover a large area of hard rock bottom, show your bait to more fish, and generally be more successful. And red grouper make it really easy because if you're a new, new, uh, if you're new to the area and you just bought a boat or you're not that experienced offshore and you don't have a big uh, log hook with thousands of numbers, red group are easy because you can walk back here to the aisle back here, pick yourself up a top spots chart, uh, which show you a bunch of local public wrecks, public artificial reefs, uh, and they don't put. I got a chronic dry mouth or something today. And they don't put uh, those artificial structures or the artificial wrecks on sand bottom or soft bottom. They always put those type of uh, structures on hard bottom. Anybody know the reason why? They do that. That's pretty close. What it is is it's for shrimp. Shrimp uh, trawls will go over softer sand bottom. So if you put an artificial, back when it was legal, uh, we were able to uh, sink our own boats. So we would uh, tow out a boat when I was a kid uh, and then uh, cut a hole in the side of it, or my favorite thing, shoot it with shotgun. And uh, the boat sinks, and we have our own artificial reef. Uh, and my dad had the bright idea of, oh, we'll do it out in the sand where no one will find it. Well, we did that, we went back two weeks later, it was completely gone. And uh, looking into it, looking into it, and a shrimper had uh, come by with his net, snagged his net on our wreck or on our reef, and dragged it away. And uh, later, kind of got a little bit upset that we ruined his nets. But whole other story. Uh, so basically, they do these artificial reefs and artificial wrecks and structure over hard bottoms, so these shrimp trawls won't drag them all away. So. When you go look at some of that artificial wreck, that's going to give you a great starting spot. Uh, each municipality, Madeira Beach, Treasure Island, St. Pete Beach, they all have uh, a wreck named after them. There's Madeira Beach Reef, which is about three miles west of Madeira Beach. There's St. Pete Beach Reef, which is about nine miles west of St. Pete Beach. And these city municipalities use them as a dumping ground when they knock down a bridge or they do road construction or they change out the sewers and they pull those big culverts out of the ground. They take them offshore and dump them. And those give you a good starting spot. Starting spot. Then you can move around that area and you're going to find hard bottom. There's a lot of good uh, cracks, crevices, potholes around that area. And if you start out, always look at your bottom machine. I get so frustrated when I get on a boat and the guy's sitting there drinking the beer, talking to his buddy with his bottom machine off, and he's going 50 miles an hour out to the spot. It's like, dude, you just passed probably six fishing spots that would have been better than the one you're going to. But you had no idea because your bottom machine was off and you weren't looking at it. So very important to turn on your bottom machine, watch your bottom machine, and if you pass the spot, my father always said, you never run past fish to go find fish. Makes a little bit of sense, you know? If you see a spot you have a fish, stop, fish it, see what happens. Give it a second, if they start popping in the boat, turn around, anchor on it, maybe you have a good day, you know? And that's how you find your bottom. And that's how uh, someone can start out fishing this area and get a wide, wide variety of spots. So to answer your question, near shore grouper, red grouper drifting is the best technique a long leader, six, eight foot leader, uh, about a six to seven knot hook. I like using a long strip of squid uh, or a, a pinfish hook up underneath the mouth. When you're drift fishing, you got to hook up underneath the mouth, out the top of the face, 
so that hook's on top of the fish, so you're not dragging the lot. And a longer leader is because that lead will sometimes bounce on the bottom. And as it bounces, it makes a little puff of sand. So if your hook's close to your lead, if that lead bounces, that fish is going to be scared away from your bait. When you're drift fishing, you do a little bit longer lead. What was your, I think, the green shirt, you were next. Yeah. I was going to ask, I'm going out on 39 hours, I forgot to see Nice. How long was the top shot you put on your uh, the question was on a 39 hour trip, how long of a top shot would you use? A top shot, uh, there's a few different reasons why braid is not good offshore. First, braid does not have any stretch. So when you hook a fish with straight braid, that fish is going to shake its head and tear a hole bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger into the side of its face. And eventually he's going to be able to spit your hook really easily. So that's one reason you don't use braid. Another reason you don't use braid is it cuts through the water a lot differently than monofilament. And the guy next to you, his monofilament's going to have a big arc in it, and your braid's going to be more straight up and down. And you can come together and get tangled really easily. And when you get tangled, there's no way to untangle braid from mono. There's one way, and it's using this knife right here. By cutting that, that braid, you know? And that's the braid's expensive, so you don't want to keep having to cut your braid all the time. Uh, also, when you hook a fish with braid, the guys around you are using mono and that braid touches that mono, that braid's like a razor sharp and it's pulled tight. So it'll cut other people off. Another good reason you don't use braid. Um, that's about it. So the monofilament top shot acts as a shock absorber. So if you add monofilament or fluorocarbon on top of your braid, it's basically like adding, for example, on the spinning rod, myself. Uh, so on the spinning rod you'll see the braid is right here and, I, and then I've got a big piece of monof or fluorocarbon in this case on top of that braid. So this acts as a shock absorber. So when that fish is bouncing, and not only is my rod tip moving, but also this monofilament stretching, allowing a little bit of shock to be absorbed by the line instead of that fish's face, allowing it to tear that hole in the side of his face. Spit my hook. Also, if I was to get tangled, typically you get tangled, if you're paying attention, typically you get tangled closer to your hook. So that way, when I get tangled, I'm able to undo it, because it's mono to mono. Also, uh, it just, it, it helps hide that line. That braided line is very easy to see underwater, whereas this foil carbon is not. So it also hides your line away from the fish. Uh, so to answer your question, as far as how long the top shot do you use, it really comes down to a few things. On a 39 hour, I do a longer top shot to start because on a 39 hour trip, you get 20 hours of fishing time, 70 to 100 miles from shore. You're fishing for 20 hours, your line's gonna get shaved or you're gonna break off. And if you tie a short top shot, the first time you cut it in half, you're gonna have to totally redo the whole thing. So I do a little bit longer to start. That way if I get broke off from the bottom or my line gets a little chafed, I can cut a little bit off and make it fresh again. Uh, so to start, I start a little bit longer. Uh, but typically, I was wondering where that thing went. I've been wondering for a long time where I'm just going to pop it up top here. There we go. We've got to keep the sponsors happy. All right, so, uh, so what I was saying is uh, the, you start a little longer, so if you lose a little bit, you still have a good enough top shot. So, uh, normally my rule of thumb, especially for someone who hasn't done it before, is about two thirds of your line in the water. You want it to be monofilament or fluorocarbon. So you're fishing 100 foot of water, two thirds of your line is about 60 foot. Um, the more experienced you are, the less of the top shot you need. Because you're going to make sure if you feel someone's line, if I start feeling someone's line, I'm going to quick reel up as fast as I can. That way, if he feels my line or if I hook a fish, uh, it's going to be mono to mono by the time you get tangled. Um, but if, you, if you're not good enough to feel that, if, if, if it's your first time, a longer top shot's good to start. Uh, but the more experience you are, the shorter you get. For example, for myself, if I was fishing a 39 hour, I'd have about 25 to 30 feet of a top shot. When I'm mega or snapper fishing. When I'm grouper fishing, I'd probably have about 40, 50 feet. Uh, because with grouper, I want more stretch because they're going to dig a lot harder uh, and they're, uh, you 
tend to get ch chained and broke off more frequently. Whereas scatter, I want more sensitivity. They're going to be a lot quicker. I want a lot more uh, power. Uh, and they are going to shake their heads quite a bit, but you're typically using a softer rod when you're fishing the snapper, so you don't need as much stretch in your line. That answer your question? Yeah. Another long word than answer. I get kind of like a two part. You, I guess I use the weights and get sort of built in. Mm -hmm. on each side. You, know, you wouldn't recommend those? Absolutely not. Uh, his question was, he uses the weights with, uh, sorry, I'm, I don't need the, the Nancy, I just want to make sure everybody heard. He's using weights where you tie both bends. So basically you have a swivel on each side of the weight. Uh, in my, my opinion, that is not a good uh, option to use, and I'll show you why. The only way I fish is with a slip leg, and there's a good reason why, and I'll show you. A slip leg is simply a lead that is able to slip up and down your main line. And the reason why you use a slip lead is because when this is sitting on the bottom, I'm going to put the rod down so I can show you a little bit better. When this is sitting on the bottom, sitting flat on the bottom, I can take one finger and just tap the line and it's going to move that line through that swivel. So just the little babyest nudge of this hook is going to move the line through that swivel. And if I'm moving the line through the swivel, what's my rod tip do? It's moving. Whereas if I tie this six ounce swivel on either side, the bite has to be so big that it's going to move this six ounce swivel, or the six ounce lead before my rod tip moves. So basically when you use that type of lead that's tied on either side, you have to get a bite strong enough to disturb that lead before you feel it in the tip of your rod. So I always use a slip leg because your sensitivity in that bite is so much greater. Uh, so that works. Don't get me wrong, it works. You probably catch plenty of fish like that. But when you get used to feeling that bite with that slip leg, it is so much better. Really important when you're fishing. Can you pull your leg back a little bit? When you're fishing, I always drop down. First step is you drop down the bottom. You always we're going to go, uh, some of you guys are just starting out, so I'm going to go all the way from the top. Been out before, bear with me a little bit. So when you drop down, you drop down until your line stops going out. That's how you know you hit the bottom. I like to reel up my slack, and then what I do is uh, I sit there for a few seconds. Typically, my dad will literally count to 60 and drive me nuts. I typically just wait a little bit and see if I get a nibble. The idea behind that is a lot of times, guys, uh, you're more aggressive fish. As soon as you drop down, that more aggressive fish is going to be ready to come out of this rock and hit that bait. Uh, and so whatever you do is when you drop down, I'll see a lot of guys, they'll drop down the bottom, and then all of a sudden they're reeling up, oh, oh, now I'm dropping back down, oh, I'm going to lift my rock up. No. You drop down the bottom, you get a tight new weight. After a little bit of time, a minute or two, if you don't get a bite right away, what I like doing is I'll lift my rod tip up real slowly and I'll drop it back down the bottom. Anybody know why? No? Strain the leader, that he got it right. The idea is to strain the leader. So when I drop down, a lot of times your uh, hook or your bait is going to drop pretty close to your leg. We'll show you on the floor over here. So if I drop down the bottom, most of the time your lead and your hook are gonna drop pretty close together. But if I had bait on my hook and there's current, when I lower, lift my rod tip up real slow and drop it back down to the bottom real slow, typically the current is gonna pull that bait away from my lead and it's gonna straighten out that lead and it's gonna make it look a lot more natural. So after you hit the bottom, wait for that aggressive fish. If he doesn't hit you right away, straighten that leader. And then you always want to keep your line tight enough to feel that lead, but not tight enough to move the lead off the bottom. And if you're sitting there at the side of the boat drinking a beer, talking to your buddy, you're not going to catch any fish. You got to be paying attention. I keep my thumb and four, I, I didn't even know I'm doing it. It's, it's instinctual. You keep your thumb and forefinger on that line so you can feel that lead. And if the boat's rocking, which how often does the boat not rock a little bit? 
It's always rocking. It's a moving platform. So you're constantly moving with the boat. I'm constantly moving with the boat. Wake up there, buddy. Grab the left for me again. All right, so you're gonna be my wave. So you're gonna move up and down like you would in a, on the motion of a boat. So don't get too crazy with me. Move up and down. See, I'm gonna constantly move with the boat. Now notice that line, staying tight. If the boat's going down, my rod tip's going up. The boat's going up, my rod tip's going down. I'm not gonna ever just hold my rod tip steady because watch what my leg's doing. Right, my line's getting loose, I'm not feeling the fish. Thanks. And if, uh, if, it's, if, if you're just holding your rod tip steady and the boat's moving up and down, your lead's doing this on the bottom. So nothing's gonna get close to your lead when it's doing that. So you gotta constantly be monitoring that lead, keeping that lead tight enough to hold uh, bottom, but not tight enough to disturb that lead on the bottom. What was your question again? <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So that's the biggest thing, is making sure that you're keeping that slip lead flat on the bottom so that, that uh, line can move through that uh, lead very easily without disturbing the bottom. You have more sensitivity. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, the second part, I remember. Now, we got that group. I seen a fella out there using one of the big jigs, feathers, or whatever on it, and he was popping it up down and catching them. I tried it. Yeah. What is the technique for that? Because I wasn't doing nothing. Vertical jigging is yeah. what it's called. And vertical jigging works really well for a few different species. I like vertical jigging for amberjack, scant grouper, uh, tuna, kingfish occasionally. You can get gags on it, but typically you catch gags when they're super aggressive, uh, when they're feeding real heavily, which is springtime, and then that transitional period, October, November. Uh, so it's not all the time when you get gags vertical jigging, but a lot of times you can't, and you only catch them right on the bottom. So you drop all the way down the bottom to your jigs flat on the bottom, and then you work that rod. Um, but jigging is a lot like work, because yeah. uh, you're using a big weight, uh, and you're moving that weight pretty good. Uh, this is an example of a vertical jig that I would use uh, for grouper. Uh, it's just a simple diamond, uh, it's called a diamond jig. This is a hammered diamond jig because it's all porous. Uh, and the hammered diamond jigs work really well for scamp and gag grouper. You just drop these to the bottom and you just jig your rod. You move your rod all the way to the water and then all the way up above your head. And then as soon as you get to the top of your head, you drop your rod tip real quick and you give it slack, and that lets the, the weight fall. You always get hit by the weight's falling. And then you go to jig up again, your rod doubles over. It's a lot of fun, uh, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> and typically what you're doing is when you're vertical jigging, you'll do that a few times. Uh, typically what I do is about five to 10 times, uh, depending on how, um, how, how long I've been jigging. If I just started out, it'd be 10 times. If I've been jigging for 20 minutes, well, it'll be a few times. Uh, but you jig about five to 10 times. And then what I'll do is, when I lower my rod tip, I'll slap the handle of my reel. And that'll make the reel move one or two times. Then I'll jig again five to 10 times. And then I'll lift my rod tip up, drop my rod tip real quick and slap the handle again. And then we'll go once or twice. Then I'll jig a little bit more. And then I'll keep doing that process until you gotta pay attention because the jig will come out of the water if you're not looking. I'll do that process until I can see the jig. Once you can see the jig, it's a good idea to reel it up, cast it back out, start over. That's how you burn the jig. It's a lot of work. A lot of work. Uh, another thing that people do is you can jig along the bottom. Red grouper fishing, uh, occasionally gag grouper, but not too often. Uh, hogfish, mangrove snapper. You can get a bucktail jig or a jig, uh, one of my favorite jigs for red grouper. Uh, and I don't think I'm gonna have one handy. Yeah, I can it. No, well, it's kind of. One of these white uh, plastic grubs on the back of a bug tail. Uh, you, you see those huge, huge rubber uh, uh, grub backs, and they're, they look like they're this thick. Those are red grouper uh, grubs. You put those on a, uh, like a two to four ounce jig head, 
and you cast that way away from the boat, and then you just lower your or lift your rock tip up off the bottom, lower your rock tip real slow, and basically once you cast away from the boat, you lift your rock tip up, you just kind of bounce it along the bottom until you get back to straight up and down. Then you reel it up and reset. Do that again. Those work pretty well for the red grouper when they're aggressive. Uh, and it allows you to cover a lot of area. Especially red grouper, you're going to find one or two in a pothole. There'll be one or two in this pothole. There'll be one or two in this pothole. That's why drift in a large area allows you to be successful because you're showing your bait to all those fish in an area. If you anchor up for red grouper, it's more difficult because you'll catch a handful of red grouper and you got to move. You don't, you, you don't, um, there's very rarely do you get on an uh, anchor and you can catch two dozen red grouper. Pretty rare, unless you're fishing way out deep and you've got a big, huge six, eight foot ledge. Most of the time you catch two, three, four, five, six, maybe eight to ten red grouper, then the bite shuts off and you got to move. It's called stick and move. That allows you to cover a larger area. So you're anchor fishing, two or three guys are fishing straight up and down, two or three guys are jigging away from the boat. But it's not for me. So my question kind of goes to what you already asked, what you were showing. Uh, I'm from Southern California, totally different fishery. A lot of jigging out there. A lot of jigging. For, the fish is different. But anyways, you know, fishing with, with an egg weight, Yes. We don't do that. Very yeah. rarely. Yeah. It's shallow water, bay fishing for bass. Okay. Usually. So my question here is, like if I go on a half day next weekend, is it fish the anchor, fish the drift? On a half day trip, uh, our half day trip is our shortest trip, closest to shore. Uh, and the big difference from where you fish in Southern California to where we fish here, Central West Coast of Florida is the grouper capital of the world. It, uh, and the reason why is our topography. You can go 100 miles out, in some areas you're only in maybe 200, 300 foot of water. Uh, whereas in Southern California, you're 100 miles out, you're in 6,000, 8,000 foot of water a lot of times. So uh, in our area, it gets deep so slowly. Uh, and on a half day trip, we go 9 to 12 miles, but we're only in 30, 40, 50 foot of water. So we're going to catch smaller fish. Typically we target gray snapper. They're also known as a white grunt. Uh, and then we catch corgis and sea bass. You have a chance for some hog fish. So most of what we're going to be catching on a half day trip is smaller but good eating fish. So typically on a half day trip, all I'd be bringing out is a spinning rod and reel uh, with uh, about a, maybe a, a three quarter ounce to one ounce egg sinker and about a four off hook. And I'd be using live shrimp for the hog fish a lane snapper, or if it's your first time and not as experienced, a little piece of squid is going to stay on the hook real well. You'll be able to catch a big old stringer of a lot of smaller but good eating fish. Uh, to get bigger fish like a grouper, our 10 hours, the shortest trip we offer with a chance for grouper. Right now we're catching a lot of hogfish out there. Uh, on a half day trip, if we can, we're going to drift the whole trip because we cover a larger area, we show our baits and more of those grace snapper, and it again helps us to be more successful. On a 10 hour, we're gonna drift a little bit to make sure, because on a party boat, you've got guys that wanna catch hogfish, or would be happy to anchor at one spot, and fish for three hours, and catch two or three hogfish. But then you'll have the guy out here from Omaha, and uh, he's never been fishing before, and he just wants to catch fish and have action. So on a party boat as a captain, you try to keep everybody happy, so you have to have a balance. So on a 10-hour, there's going to be a balance of some anchor fishing for hogs and whatever else we can get, a mangroves, and then there's going to be some drifting to catch a bunch of those smaller goody gray snapper. On a 12-hour extreme, on a 39-hour, on those more what we call specialty trips, all anchor fishing. We're anchored up in specific structure to try to get some big quality fish. Uh, so 12-hour trips or longer are specialty trips. Those are trips where we're going to anchor all the time. Uh, whereas 5- and 10-hour trips are more day trips. They're fun for the whole family. We offer a half-price discount for kids. Any trip we offer a half-price discount for kids is a good indicator where 
is kind of more geared towards the action, trying to catch everybody as much as we can. So to answer your question, yes, on five hours we're drifting primarily, targeting smaller fish, but you can bring that, that spin rod. I love going on half days uh, with my wife or my wife's family or friends from out of town. The half day's a lot of fun. Uh, and if you bring that spinning reel, you catch a great snapper this big, uh, with a light spinning reel, it's a lot of fun. And they taste awesome. And the restaurant next door offers to cook them up. So you can come in, fillet your fish up fresh, walk next door, sit by the water, enjoy a cocktail, and the fresh fish at this dock pretty cool. Smell. 
Uh, so a brine can bake is really, really cool. It really, really works well. Helps you get uh, thicker skin on all your bait. And on every one of our trips, we provide all your dead bait. So yes, we will provide the bait for you to brine. And on the way out, the crew will be there to help you, uh, show you what to do. I'll be there until you leave uh, to get you set up as well. All you need is a cooler and your salt. Just plain table salt works. Some people say ice cream salt. Some people say kosher dill, whatever, you know. Some people get crazy with it. I just use table salt. And a lot of people have different methods. Like uh, we have a guy on every one of our 39 hours, he's named John. He goes out uh, for free because uh, he's been going out since I was a kid. And now what he does is he fishes for free. So when the boat stops, he's fishing. He's focused on fishing, but when the boat's moving, he is your asset. You guys use it, abuse it. Make it work for it, all right? So, uh, yeah, and he'll help you out. He'll take your photos for you. He'll uh, teach you how to tie knots. He'll help you show you how to grind baits on the way out. He'll help control. Uh, so anything you need or want, he's there to help you out. Because uh, on the way out, the crew's sleeping. So he'll help you grind your bait, uh, and get you set up. And he says the best way to grind your bait Fill your cooler halfway up with ice, uh, and then you put a couple of uh, scoops of salt water in there, get a little brine mix going, and then pour a bunch of salt in there. So you have super salty, icy liquid, and you just stick your baits in there. Uh, I prefer to make the, the OCD approach, where you've got the layers and the salt mixed in. And up in the morning, if I'm using an angle cooler, the ice hasn't melted quite yet, so I'll just put a scoop of ice water on top of it, or a scoop of warm bait water on top of it, will start kind of accelerating that, because you want it to thaw out a little bit. You want it to thaw and get that mixture of juice and blood going. What? What? Yes, yeah, what I, what I, some people don't. What he asked is, do you plug them out first? Uh, that's the age old question is, uh, do you cut your bait, prep, prepare your bait as you brine it? Me, yes, I always prepare my bait, so that way as I pull it out of the brine, all I gotta do is stick it on the hook. Other people say, don't do that. Brine them whole, and then just before you drop them in the water is when you cut them and prepare them. That way it's leaking even more juice. I like uh, brining them already cut because I feel like it kind of traps all the juice inside there. Uh, it really is personal preference. If I have bait scissors and I'm not feeling, if I'm trolling and drinking beer on the way out, I won't prepare my bait and I'll just brine them whole and I'll use my bait scissors to prepare each bait. Uh, but if I don't have bait shears and I'm bored on the way out, then yeah, I'll cut my bait and brine it. Uh, that way, by the time I start fishing, I'm ready to rock. Uh, so it's really personal preference. But uh, I asked Will, I made a video, if you haven't seen it yet, just two or three days ago, about uh, what to, how to pack for a 39 hour and tips and tricks. It's like 28 minutes long. And I go through all this stuff and bring it. I asked Will, the first mate on the 39 hour for the last 14 years, what's something that you recommend to people their first trip? One thing he said was make sure you bring scissors. That way, when you pull out a bait, uh, on, the, on that trip we provide thread thins. Unfortunately, I didn't have any thread thins thawed out, so I grabbed some sardines. So on that trip, if you brought scissors, you would grab your sardine, you'd cut the head, you'd cut the tail, and you'd be ready to go. With the thread thins, you'd cut the head, cut the tail, and then trim the belly. So you have this little piece of meat that looks like this. after you're done. The sardine, you just cut the head, cut the tail, you're ready to rock. Thread then you trim the belly to make it look like this. Uh, so when you're, when you're using a thread then that's three different cuts. So with the scissors, it's quick. If you don't have scissors, you gotta cut your bait up each time. It takes a little bit of time. That's why grinding them all already pre-cut works really well. If you bring the scissors, you can do this right at the rail. So it's kind of personal preference. All that to say. Uh, you had a question? So he was talking about out there at the sky with the cane fish. Yeah. The um, I, I do that to get a lot of shark and stuff, yeah. but I use bait fish. Is there any other kind of Greenbacks. Bait? Greenback. Greenback. Yeah. Stuff? White bait is a great way to avoid sharks while targeting those king fish. Okay, then how long would you suggest we leave it on? Um, how many minutes or an hour out? Uh, I 
to be my day on a, under a balloon as long as I can. I mean, uh, it really depends. I mean, if you've got a bird pecking at your bait or you feel a nibble or you, you see that balloon move, it's a good idea to reel in your bait because it's fresh. Your bait, your bait gets tired just like you. If you're swimming, if you, if someone caught you with a net, put a hook through your face and casted you into a swimming pool, after 20, 30 minutes, you'd be pretty tired not doing so hot. So it's the same idea with the bait. After 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that bait starts to tire out and just kind of hang there. And at that point, you might as well be using that bait. So reel it in every now and again, get a fresh bait. Fresher, more lively bait is good. Uh, when I cast a balloon out with a live bait, I want that balloon moving. If that balloon stops moving, the bait's not moving. Reel it in, reset. So, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, no. <laughs> this question was when you're targeting an amberjack, is there anything you can do to make sure the amberjack doesn't kill your butt? Not much you can do. Those amberjack are really strong, big fish. Um, the biggest thing you can do to make sure they don't kick your butt is use the right tackle. You want to hook a big fish, you want to catch a big fish, you got to use a big tackle. Another thing is you don't use a spinning reel. So often, when people come out there and they're like, I want to catch a big fish. How do I catch a big fish? And they're holding this reel. Well, you don't catch them with that. The, the big thing between a conventional reel and a spinning reel, because nowadays, when I, was, when I was your age, and I went out on a 39 hour, if I brought uh, this reel on a 39 hour, the crew, because of, uh, because they